Hey everybody, I'm Ben Graham. This is our global economy course. And today we're talking about the political economy of security. Um, this is something I'm working a lot on right now, and, and I would love to teach a whole course on this, uh, but we're going to do this in like, you know, 30 minutes, uh, because we're in a big survey class. So, so here we roll. Um, and, and in some ways I'm going to break this into a couple of different lectures of sort of a guns and butter lecture, and then a kind of how military power, uh, creates wealth lecture. We're not going to get to economic interdependence and peace in this recorded lecture, though it's something we'll be uh, covering at, in some other places in the course a little bit. Um, but we're going to start, as we often do, with kind of like, what's the empirical uh, uh, setting of the world that we live in, right? So this is all battle deaths um, from both interstate wars, like wars between countries and civil wars. Um, and, you know, you'll see it's quite lumpy, right? Where, where wars are rare events, right? Which means you know, we might be going through a time period in history, like we have been since the end of the Cold War, where human beings are not dying uh, in war nearly as much as they were uh, throughout the 20th century. And we say, hey, you know, we're in this more peaceful period. Well, probably so, unless a huge uh, war breaks out in the next 10 years. And we're like, oh, no, actually, we just were in kind of a little lull in, in, in kind of a long-term trend here. So, you know, you got guys like Steven Pinker, people like Steven Pinker are going to argue that we are on this path sort of toward um, uh, toward a more peaceful kind of human existence. Um, and then Bear Braumuller has a very good book that sort of looks at, at this idea that war is a rare event. And we really don't know where we're at um, in, in the big picture, but it looks like war is becoming, uh, we're seeing less of it over time. And one thing we're seeing less of in particular are wars of conquest that are economically motivated. So this idea that I'm gonna go steal territory uh, and use that to make me wealthier, um, that has declined a lot over time. And that's what we'll be talking about kind of in the second half of this lecture. Um, but I wanna, I wanna sort of, you know, so we, we have academic silos sometimes of different kind of little fields and subfields that develop. And then scholars in these different research areas don't talk to each other enough and kind of get locked in sometimes silly battles and some of this stuff. And I think that's partly why we don't see nearly enough attention to the political economy of security, um, where we have scholars of interstate conflict. And a lot of them come from theoretical traditions that really emphasize this idea that states care about their own security and don't care about anything else. And they make this kind of you know, in the extreme form of this literature, they make this assumption that states really don't care about anything except their own security. They don't care about getting rich, which is silly, right? And then you have IPE scholars, political economy scholars like me, over on this other side who often uh, make these simplifying assumptions in our economic models, and economists are super guilty of this, that sort of assume away the fact that hey, when we're trying to reach, agree on a price, you know, trading something in the market, you know, I can't just take a stick and hit you over the head and take your stuff. And that's true between individuals and that's true between states, right? And so all these market interactions, they occur in the shadow of power, right? And that who has military power and can, at the end of the day, if they get really unhappy with the, with the economic arrangements, can just go conquer the other person and steal their stuff, that affects the economic deals that get made. That affects the shape of markets, right? And so often economists sort of ignore the role of the military and folks who study military power and conflict ignore the role of the economy and we don't get enough work at this intersection. And to me, and granted, this is what I'm working on a book project on, biased, biased person here, but, um, but to me, this is where all the action's at, uh, especially in the 21st century. So I'm gonna be telling a story here where economic factors drive a country's ability to fight right? So how much wealth do you have to spend on your military? How, how educated are your soldiers? Can they, you know, can they fly drones? And can they do all this really complicated modern warfare stuff, right? And how quickly and rapidly can you innovate, right? You know, so the U.S. recently imposed really large sanctions on chip making technology, a very general use technology against China to prevent, to slow down their innovation at the technological frontier, uh, to prevent them from uh, catching up to us essentially in weapons technology. Uh, and so a country's economy, how well you can manufacture computer chips and, and all these sorts of things and how much, how broad your industrial base is really shapes 
how much military power you can build and project. Okay, but the structure of your economy and what you make and how you make it and what you have comparative advantage in also really shapes what a country wants, right? We talked about the first wave of globalization coming about with British power and the Brits really pushed for open markets because they had been at the forefront of the industrial revolution and they expected to win in open market competition. So they created an economic order uh, that was uh, much more free trade than had historically been the case. It's also true of the United States after World War II put in place this very free trade world order because we expected to win in free market competition, right? So the structure of the economy of the, uh, of the hegemonic powers at those time periods really drove the nature of the security order. Um, okay. And then, you know, both the structure of your own economy and your position in global networks of exchange uh, really shape whether fighting is a good way to get what you want right? Is, you know, if I go start a war here to take this thing, am I going to disrupt all this trade or all this investment that I'm profiting from, right? If I have a whole bunch of foreign investment in this other country and I go start a war with them, I might literally be bombing my own factories, right? So the nature of your economic position shapes whether fighting is a good or a bad way to get what you want. Um, okay. So, so economics, security, deeply intertwined here. We're going to start with a real basic guns and butter story. And, and I find this, you know, at the end of the day, somewhat unsatisfying. It only gets us a little bit of the way to understanding how economics and security are intertwined. Uh, but it's definitely like kind of where the field starts. And to the extent that economists think a lot about uh, military power, they think about it predominantly through this lens. That just basically, if you're spending money on the military, and historically, governments have done this a lot, a whole lot of government revenue historically has gone to military power both to preserve the independence of the state, right? To keep other countries from invading you and taking you over, um, and even to repress your own population and protect the ruler from their own people, right? So military power takes a big proportion of government budget historically. Um, and any money the government is spending on the military, they're not spending on other things. That's This is the guns versus butter. You can either spend on the military or you can spend on anything else and we'll call everything else butter. Uh, so when you're spending on military, you're not um, building roads, you're not building schools, you're not paying uh, pensions to your elderly, you're not um, paying for health care for your citizens, you're not investing in civilian research and development on things like vaccines, um, right? So you have lost consumption in the present, right? You're not paying out uh, unemployment benefits or food stamps or retire, you know, or pensions, right? And so your citizens are consuming less because the government's taxing them and spending it on the military. But then you're losing out. And this is really the big stuff. The government's not investing in things like infrastructure and education um, that foster long-run growth, not investing in innovation, right? So some arming spending is on innovation, right? And we do get spillovers uh, out of government spending on the military, right? In particular, it's such a big portion of government budget, a lot of that does go to R&D, and some of that spills over in important ways to the civilian sector in aerospace. I mean, the internet came out of DARPAnet, right? Or I'm sorry, ARPANET, which was a, a defense uh, a project, right? So you do get spillovers, but not nearly as much as you would get if you were just actually trying to invest in innovation aimed at the civilian economy, right? So you get some of those spillovers. Um, but, but and because you're when you're spending on the military, you're investing less and innovating less, uh, you get slower long-run economic growth. And that's cumulative over time, right? That a slightly slower growth rate leads one country to be, you know, a third as wealthy as another one, uh, you know, 60 years down the line, right? And really shapes who's a world power and who's not, right? Who has a bunch of military power to walk around with, with, a, with a big stick and, and tell other countries what to do and who doesn't have that ability? Right. So all the military spending today can undermine actually even your military power in the long run because you're harming your own growth rate. That is true as long as, and we'll be hitting this in the second part of this class, as long as it's not possible for you to use your military actually to gain wealth. But we'll see that actually states do that a lot in a lot of states' strategies for getting wealthy over time, for having this long run growth rate that is the key to power in the long run. Um, a lot of that's actually driven by how states use military power. Um, they use military power to create and shape markets and, and that sort of thing. Okay. 
So in this guns and butter story, the more you're spending on arming, right, which sort of like we're talking both wages for soldiers and actually buying physical guns and military R&D spending. So we say arming and that's kind of like all military spending. The more you're spending on that, the less you have available for butter for all this civilian uh, economy spending. Um, and, and this has traditionally been a, a huge burden on societies. Uh, but it's a burden that's been falling over time, right? Um, so this is since, you know, the earliest we have sort of fairly comprehensive global data on arms spending, which is, and, and this is always shaky data, right? Because a lot of military spending is secret, but our best guess, you know, we have best guesses going back to like 1960 and, and which is well after World War II, um, right? So, so all the World War II spending has gone away um, quite some time before this. And you just see a steady decline over time globally as a share of GDP. So in real terms, the, the amount of money being spent on global militaries has, has not been declining over time, but as a share of the economy, it's been growing less slowly than the global economy. So um, it's been declining uh, over time, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing for humanity. I wanna show you a slightly uh, a longer term picture here where we do have US data going back farther than this. And, and I actually wanna to point to uh, uh, the guns butter trade-off as a source of why the US economy grew so incredibly quickly um, and why the US became uh, a world power, you know, part of this is that we didn't have to, um, we didn't have to protect ourselves from other powerful countries. We had oceans on either side of us, right? And, and, and Canada and Mexico uh, were not particularly threatening to us through, for most of our history. So we were really very safe. And we got away with super low military spending for most of the early days of the United States, right? Um, so, uh, you know, we had a big spike for the Civil War. Right, and we have a big spike for World War One and a much bigger spike for World War Two, right? Um, and throughout the Cold War, we averaged a higher uh, proportion of our GDP than than most of the world, and and we still do. Um, but uh, but for so much of our history, we we chose to spend at a very low level and invest a lot in our civilian economy instead. There were a lot of other things that that fed into uh, U.S. growth. Um, uh, over time, but this is this is one factor that that helped us out. Okay. So, um, one of the things I want to highlight, uh, you know, so I work closely uh, with Jonathan Markowitz. We, um, you know, we're two out of the three folks who run the Security and Political Economy Lab here at USC, um, and John and his collaborators have some neat work on this concept of surplus domestic product. Right. So when we think about, you know, all that story is telling you about military spending and stuff, this is all as a share of GDP. And that's usually, excuse me, how we talk about um, government spending is as a share of gross domestic product, as a share of everything the economy produces. But that's not actually the right uh, uh, denominator, right? Because you can't, as a government, you can't actually spend everything the economy makes. Right, you have to leave in place um, enough. You have to leave your citizens with enough to survive. There are times in history where governments have not, right, and they have starved large portions of their population in order to invest in different things, including war making. Um, but you are going to undermine your own long term power if you star starve your citizens. They're, among other things, no longer available to fight for you, also no longer available to produce in your economy. So, um, so when you think about like, what is the amount of money that the government could hypothetically spend on the military if they tried to tax everything they could and spend that on military power, um, the right denominator there is actually uh, what we call surplus domestic product. So that's just everything your economy produces minus the amount that's necessary to keep everybody alive. Um, and, and, you know, and, and Markowitz and, and his collaborators sort of pegged that at about $1.25 a day, which comes from the World Bank. Um, but they, they mess around with some other thresholds. Uh, so for a wealthy country, you know, if you look at US GDP and US SDP, um, they're more or less the same uh, in modern times, right? Because $1.25 a day times 300 million people, right? It's just not very much money relative to the size of our uh, economy. Um, but if you are a very poor economy where GDP per capita is only a thousand bucks or 600 bucks, and there are still countries in the world with GDP, per capita down at those levels, right? Well, now that, you know, $500 a year that it takes to keep people alive, um, or, you know, if you go at the $2 a day threshold to $700 a year, that's almost all of your GDP actually, right? So it really changes 
when we think about what's the military burden, what's the economic burden of arming uh, on those countries, um, that's the better way to look at it. And if we look at it that way, oh man, has uh, you know that that graph I showed you about like the collapse of arms spending over time, much much more dramatic if we look at it as a share of of SDP, right? Okay. Now we're going to pivot to kind of the second part of uh, of this lecture, away from guns butter and toward you know okay, so the guns butter trade off really bites if uh, if you're not able to like take that military spending and then go use it to get wealthy. But for a lot of countries over history, military power has actually been very central to their national economic strategy, right? Um, in ways, again, that economists have historically, I think, given pretty short shrift to. Uh, so let's talk about how this works. Um, you know, if we look at 16th, 17th, 18th, uh, 19th centuries, uh, a lot of the use of military power um, for for creating wealth, for for stealing wealth, was was about uh, conquest of economically valuable territory. Prior to 1950, that really meant agricultural land. After 1950, that usually meant oil. Um, but stealing economically valuable territory. So, you know, Alsace Lorraine, kind of going back. You know, look at like why uh, were the French like gung ho in World War One? Well, they lost the territory of Alsace Lorraine. Uh, uh, to the Germans, and then they were able to take it back in World War One, and then the Germans go back in there in World War Two, right? Um, so fighting over economically valuable farmland historically a big, big deal. If you if you want to grow and uh, if you want to become wealthy and powerful as a as an early modern state, right? You build up a strong military and you go conquer your neighbor, and you farm the land that used to be theirs, and you tax uh, tax their peasants, right? Um, tax their citizens. Uh, and, and you will then be more powerful than you were before you conquered that territory. Um, you know, Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, tried to conquer Kuwait. I mean, did for a short time uh, to gain access to their oil, right, as a source of power. Okay. That's become passe for a variety of reasons, um, uh, including norms, uh, including the fact that uh, agriculture in particular, but even oil has become a smaller and smaller uh, uh, proportion of the, the global economy where the states that tend to be the states that are now militarily powerful, right? If you look at the US and the EU uh, and players like this um, and, and even China, right? Well, definitely China, their wealth doesn't come from oil and agriculture predominantly. Russia is still a Petra state, but, um, but most of the militarily powerful states in the world, uh, that's not where they get their money and that's not how their economy is structured. Um, so it's so all right. So there's both economic and sort of sort of norms and political rules, uh, kind of stuff. Um, uh, U.S. enforced economic order and and some of these things um, that that have a lot to do with why conquest became passe. Uh, but just because states aren't conquering one another uh, as a way to use military power to get wealthy doesn't mean they're not doing a lot of other things. Um, and so at this point, we're sort of starting to use some slides that I uh, that come from a talk that I gave on some research uh, I'm doing with, with Professor Markowitz um, about the different pathways that remain, about all the other things besides conquest that states do to use military power to get wealthy. All right. And, and we've sort of divided up those, those uh, ways, those pathways from military power to profits into transfer pathways where you're taking stuff from other people and growth pathways where you're shaping the global economy in ways that make it larger, but also get a larger piece of that for yourself, right? So transfer pathways are taking a bigger uh, piece of the existing global economic pie, and actually usually in ways that slightly shrink that pie, um, because theft is pretty inefficient. Um, whereas growth pathways uh, are focused on growing the total size of the pie, and your slice is getting bigger uh, in absolute terms. Um, but but you're doing it in ways that actually leave the total global economy larger than they would be if you weren't using military power that way. So let's take a look at, at this first uh, kind of pair of pathways where you can either be stealing others' goods or assets, right? Or you can be protecting your own goods and assets, right? So this is the, you know, Iraq goes and tries to steal uh, valuable resources from Kuwait, right? Um, but you also get a ton of military spending in the Middle East, say from Saudi Arabia, who's deterring other states from taking their oil, right? And, and this sort of use of military power to deter states from stealing other people's stuff, your own stuff or another state's stuff, actually grows the size of the economy because when 
Saudi Arabia is deterring others, then the property rights internal to their country are secure. They can make a lot of investments in oil uh, extraction and, and refinement and that kind of thing. Um, and, and so it allows economic productivity to, to, to take place in ways that wouldn't be possible if, uh, if sort of ownership of those oil fields was constantly contested and going back and forth. Um, so by deterring theft, they're actually growing the size of the pie. Most of that gain goes to them, right? It's not like this is like some great big benevolent act to help everybody, um, but it doesn't actually shrink the pie and, it, and at the margins it grows, grows it. Similarly, um, you know, we have states that actually use where state militaries are involved in cyber theft um, or state militaries are involved in deterring cyber theft. The better you deter it, the more secure property rights are, the more innovation and investment you get um, while stealing other people's intellectual property. It's going to shrink the size of the global pie because people have less incentives to invest in innovation if they think their ideas are going to get stolen. Uh, but it's better for you, right? You get to uh, uh, enjoy that intellectual property and profit from it um, once you've stolen it. Okay. Let's look at closing and restricting markets versus opening markets, right? Um, and we see states use military power in both of those ways. So certainly, you know, we talked about the colonial era and uh, European powers establishing monopoly trading relationships with their colonies and saying everybody else has to stay out so that we can secure inputs from our colonies at artificially low prices, right? Uh, and actually, and sell them things at artificially high prices as well. So British Navigation Acts, um, you know, this was a big part of sort of the lead up to uh, uh, the American Revolution, right? Uh, the colonists didn't want to be subject to this monopoly trading relationship, um, but these market restrictions could be quite profitable. And it's not impossible to think about those being reimposed in the modern era, kind of having spheres of influence where either the US or China has uh, exclusive or, or near exclusive access to a market so that they can sell their exports at higher prices and buy their imports at lower prices. Right? But you can also use military power another way, which is to force markets open, right? And to say, hey, you know, you need to let us come in and trade, right? You can't keep your market closed. Um, and maybe us and others, you need to let trade. And this is bad for some uh, uh, folks uh, in the country where they're forcing the market open, right? And it is coercive and it does involve either killing or threatening to kill people. It's not like this is a warm, fuzzy act. Um, but this is an act that does end up with a larger global economy once you've opened up. Uh, more markets to more trade, right? A lot of that benefit is going to the state that uses military power to force the market open. But overall, we are also making the, the global uh, economy larger. So, you know, the term gunboat diplomacy comes from uh, Admiral Perry sailing to Japan, uh, anchoring some gunboats in the harbor and saying, you know, you will open up your markets or else I will uh, uh, I will destroy this city. Um, Okay, so it, this isn't just a story about the 19th century, right? When uh, the United States was uh, expanding, you know, it was leading the expansion of the NATO security umbrella into Eastern Europe. So this is like, you know, NATO in 1990, this is NATO in 2015, much farther east. Um, you know, obviously it's not something Russia is real happy about uh, now or then, um, but, uh, but a lot of that, hey, we will place your country under the NATO security umbrella, but part of qualifying for getting into NATO, a lot of the countries undertook reforms to open up their market, and, and they needed to do that in order to uh, gain access to NATO, right? So there's sort of some, some quid pro quo on, uh, we're not going to say, open up your market or we'll uh, invade you. We're going to say, open up your market or we won't protect you. So instead of using military power as a stick, we're using it as a carrot. We'll use our military power to protect you if you open up your market um, and make your country a really profitable place for us to invest and to trade with. Okay. So lastly, you can use your military power either to, to degrade others' productivity, to like to sabotage the economic productivity of your competitors, right? Or you can increase the productivity of a state that you trade with and, and invest in, right? And so. Um, You'll see things like Iran uh, engaging in some drone strikes on oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman in 2019. And what happens when, you know, Iran has a lot of reasons to engage in those strikes, and we're not going to go too much into that. But one of the things that happens 
is that if you blow up a few uh, oil tankers, um, that actually leads to a temporary spike in global oil prices. And if you are a major oil exporter, that means that for a little bit, you're getting uh, a noticeably higher price on the stuff you're selling. And so you're actually profiting from the fact that you're disrupting global oil markets, right? And we've actually seen this as a side effect of uh, the war in Ukraine, right? Where there's some of the, uh, you know, the, the war in Ukraine has been hugely economically costly to Russia, but there are channels through which the way in which uh, global energy markets are disrupted have raised the price that the US, that Russia is getting for some of their energy. Um, so some of these, you know, there are channels through which um, destroying the productivity of your competitors can make you money. And we don't want to be blind to that when we think about the costs and benefits states uh, face when they engage in military action. So a lot of times, you know, states take military actions for many, many, many reasons, but the extent to which they profit or don't profit from that uh, does does play into their cost benefit analysis for sure. Um, you know, and so if we look at, you know, another kind of destabilizing sort of story here, you know, Russia uh, invades a little separatist region called South Ossetia uh, or South Ossetia in Russia, or I'm sorry, in, in the country of Georgia, right on the, the Russia-Georgia border. Um, and it really destabilizes Georgian markets, um, makes it harder for Western multinationals to compete with Russian multinationals that are already there and are actually much better at dealing with that kind of uh, political instability um, and dealing with the Russian military than, say, uh, uh, a, a French or a German uh, multinational or an American multinational. Okay. But we also see states doing a lot to try to prop up the productivity of, uh, of their neighbors or um, enhance the efficiency of a market, right? So there's a lot, the US does a lot of anti-piracy and actually there's a huge coalition of states that does anti-piracy. I grabbed this particular photo because it's the US military collaborating with the Russian military not that long ago, 2012. And what is the domain in which they are willing to cooperate? It's anti-piracy, right? Um, you know, we see uh, states doing a lot of like pro-stability in interventions, right? And so if you see like the French, so Mali is a former French colony, the French still uh, tend to meddle a lot in, in their former colonies. Um, and, you know, so France was involved in anti-terrorism operations uh, slash sort of fighting part of the civil war on behalf of the, the government, right, and trying to stabilize uh, uh, the government in power. Um, and, and one of the effects of that is to increase the value of the French investments that are there to protect the value of the French investments and protect uh, the, the trade flows that go back and forth between France and Mali. Right, so um, so there are economic effects of the French troops being involved in Mali uh, in terms of and, you know that are profitable to to France. Okay, so you know so so that's our story, and and I think you know this these types of interventions where you're degrading others' productivity or increasing others' productivity are really where a lot of the action is at in the 21st century. Um, you know, one of the stories that I like to tell involves, you know, and it's very topical at the moment, you know, the U.S. has been providing military protection to Taiwan for a very, very long time. Um, and were it not for U.S. protection of Taiwan, uh, U.S. companies and French companies and other com companies from around the world would not have invested as much capital as they have in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan's residents would not have invested and reinvested as much capital as they have in really long-term, uh, highly innovative investments. And so now you're at a place where Taiwan Semiconductor is profoundly important in the global economy. Um, and and has it was only possible for Taiwan Semiconductor and the rest of kind of the chip industry and everything else going on on the high-tech side in Taiwan, that whole kind of industrial infrastructure only could develop because it was under the U.S. security umbrella. In the absence of U.S. military power projection, Right, Taiwan would not be nearly as wealthy as they are today, and the rest of the world wouldn't be either. We would have lost out on a whole lot of very general use uh, technology. You know, all these chip innovations that came from the competition between uh, Intel and Taiwan Semiconductor and a few other major players. That that competition um, would have been less intense, and progress would have been slower, um, and and we all would have been uh, worse off in the global economy. So. You know the you know these sorts of interventions to increase others' productivity. Again, they're not 
warm, fuzzy, uh, save the world interventions always, right? They, they can be ruthlessly economically motivated and they can make some people a lot worse off, um, but they're growing the size of the overall economy and then the state projecting the power is reaping a, a, a large portion of those benefits. Okay. So, so, you know, one note to kind of end this on is sort of thinking about what China's doing in Djibouti right now, um, or, or recently, which is that Tao, uh, China's first overseas military base, right, they, is, they placed it in this tiny little country uh, on the Gulf of Aden in, in Africa. And, you know, what you can see in this picture, right, is you can see how crucial this pathway is for global shipping, right? If you don't want to go down around the Cape of Good Hope, uh, uh, to ship between, you know, Los Angeles and, and, and India, right, then you're going to, or I'm sorry, between uh, the, from, from Los Angeles to India, you come in this way. Uh, but from, say, you know, uh, uh, DC or New York to India, right, if you don't want to be going um, either down through the Panama Canal, if you don't want to, if you want to be coming from Western Europe around uh, into this part of the world, you've got to be coming through the Gulf of Aden, right? So, so China, if they're trying to get their goods toward Europe, right? Uh, this is a really good path for them, right? Really important. They don't want the U.S. closing this off. The U.S. doesn't want China closing this off. Um, but fundamentally, neither country wants pirates stealing stuff here, right? Um, and China's also, you know, invested a lot in railroad infrastructure and other things to get goods overland from uh, the rest of Africa to ports in places like Djibouti and out to global markets. So, because the structures of the U.S. economy and China, Chinese economy are increasingly similar as China continues to um, move toward the technological frontier in more and more industries, a lot of what the U.S. wants out of a global economic order and what China wants out of a global economic order are very, very similar. Where we end up getting into trouble is that China and the U.S. actually export you know, increasingly similar things. So at the same time, we want the same overall global economic order. The economic returns to the U.S. for excluding Chinese products or for China to excluding U.S. competitors, um, those economic returns uh, are high. And so, you know, so we're going to see this dance of cooperation and competition uh, between China uh, and the United States in the coming decades and how that relationship gets managed on the economic side and the military side. You know, a lot of, you know, to say that like the fate of humanity and the well-being of humanity hangs in the balance is, is, is not really hyperbole, right? Like this is a profoundly important relationship in terms of how stable is the world, how strong is the global economy and how much wealth is created, and do we end up in, you know, in World War III? Right. So uh, so that's the note I'll leave you on. And I and I really look forward to uh, talking through a lot of this stuff in class. I will see you all soon.